Make your requests in humble faith. Verse 15, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. So what's the prayer of faith when we read that? Well, let me tell you what it isn't first. The prayer of faith is not what I often hear faith healing ministries describe. It's not screwing up all of your certainty, working yourself into some sort of lather. Oh, he's going to heal. I just know he is. That's not, uh, now I'm not, I'm not trying to make fun of that aspect of, of the segment of Christianity, but some people will try to convince you that the prayer of faith in this case is having absolutely no doubts whatsoever. I mean, yes, James does say in chapter one, but let him ask in faith with no doubting for the one who doubts is like the wave of sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. But as we talked about several months ago when we looked at this passage, that what is in view here is the object of your faith. Does God hear you or not? Is God big enough or powerful enough to be effective in your prayer, in what you're praying for? What do you believe about God? That's the certainty that we need to understand is being discussed there in that passage. So in those things, there should be no doubt in what you believe. That kind of a lack of faith, James says, is a man who's unstable. He's going to be tossed around every which way. He won't even know which God he's praying to necessarily. But if you believe in the God of the Bible, then you should not doubt that God is there and that he cares because he does. But often people who are trying to do a healing ministry of prayer will say, well, if you really want to be healed, you have to have absolutely no doubt that your physical healing is what God wants. It's actually a terrible way to practice faith if I can be so blunt. If that's what belief is, then what happens if the prayer is not answered? And sometimes prayers are not answered, right? You and I have prayed enough. We know sometimes the answer is not the answer we're looking for. Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is silence. So what happens if the prayer is not answered in the way we ask? And that's what we went into prayer with. There's really then only two explanations. Either God isn't there, or if he's there, he's not powerful, or one of us that's involved in this prayer lacks faith. Who is it? Is it you? On the one hand, an unanswered prayer pushes someone away from faith in the true God of the universe. Maybe God isn't there after all. I mean, my child still has leukemia. Or it forces out some sort of witch hunt to weed out those with a lack of faith. Somebody has a slight doubt out there. I'm going to find out who it is. Obviously, they don't have enough faith because my child still has leukemia. See, people act as though they can control whether or not God works in that sort of tradition. They act like, oh, God will be obligated to me if I have enough faith. I don't see that anywhere in Scripture. And so they set themselves up as the power broker in a faith healing project. But you can't be because only the Holy Spirit can heal. If healing occurs, it is only happening through the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the prayer of faith must be, has to be, a prayer of dependence on God. The prayer of faith is a prayer that displays dependence, not control. Those are diametrically opposed ideas. So let me give you an example of a prayer of faith. In Mark chapter 9, a father comes with a demon-possessed little boy. Sorry, I'm stealing your thunder, Jim. Next week, I know you're getting to it. A father comes with a demon-possessed little boy, and he comes to Jesus, and he says, I brought my son to you in hopes that you would heal him. And Jesus says, all things are possible to one who believes, which is sort of a challenge, isn't it? I mean, you can recognize that as a challenge from Jesus. Do you really believe that I can do this or not? But look at the man's response in verse 24. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief, which to me sounds kind of confusing. They're opposites. Basically, the father is saying, I don't know. I do and I don't. I have faith, I guess, but I don't know that I have enough faith. I wish I had more faith. Please help me. That's what he says. And Jesus says, well, go figure it out then. And once you have enough faith, come back and see me. Oh, by the way, I only have a couple of years here. So, you know, hurry up. No, he doesn't say that. When you read the story, Jesus says, that'll do. That's enough faith right there. That was a prayer of faith. Even though the man confesses that he has doubts, exactly. 
Because that confession of doubts is a confession of dependence. If it depends on me, I know I'm not going to do this. But with your help, yes. So help my unbelief. Listen, a prayer of faith is simply a very specific, very direct request, which acknowledges that we're placing the person, the situation, the request itself under the authority of God and leaving it there. A mature believer says, Lord, this is what we're asking for. Of course, we have uncertainties. Who in this world doesn't? We don't even know if this is your will. That's one of our biggest uncertainties. But we're coming to you because we know that only you can accomplish this. That's a prayer of faith. It's a prayer that acknowledges complete dependence, which means it will not break a person of faith if it's not answered the way I pray it. Of course, the ultimate prayer of faith is a prayer of repentance. This is why James includes it here in verse 15. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. You see, it is repent and then believe. If we, if we move those and reverse the order in those and we say, oh, I believe, we'll never get to repentance. Because our lack of answer will then say, oh, well, I don't need to have faith in that God. Because it's only the prayer of a righteous person that availeth much, to quote the King James of that verse which is how I memorized it initially. See, if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven because he repents first. That's how, what you have to do in order to have a relationship with God. You cannot come to God and say, oh, I'm going to tell you how this is going to work. You have to come to God and say, I'm a sinner. Woe is me. You see, this is the problem is that the demons believe. Remember James 2.19? We looked at that a couple of months ago. The demons believe in God. That's not the issue. The issue is the demons never repent. See, in your dependence, you are placing yourself completely at his mercy. That's what it is to repent. And that's what God desires of you and me. So it is by faith that you're saved by grace as you come to him in repentance, and then you believe that he saves you. It is by faith in his grace that healing occurs as well. 